there's nothing wrong that you can say to someone who's ready to get sober. And there's nothing right that you can say to someone who isn't ready to get sober. Welcome to Self Made and Sober. I'm your host, Andrew Lassis with selfmade coaching.com. And in this podcast, it's my job to interview people who are not only crushing it in business, but have also struggled with addiction in the past and are in long term recovery. Be sure to join our Facebook group where we help entrepreneurs grow and scale their business at facebook.com slash groups slash SMC Mastermind, like Self-Made Coaching Mastermind. I hope you enjoy the show and be sure to subscribe and rate the show afterwards so you can get notified each Friday when we put out a new episode. Welcome to Self-Made and Sober. I'm your host, Andrew Lassis, and with me today is Bill Somerville. Bill's the owner of Dawn Patrol Digital, which is a lead generation company that focuses on real estate and insurance professionals. And he's not only crushing it in the marketing field, but he's also been sober since 2014. And Bill, happy belated uh, 35th birthday and welcome to the show. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Definitely. Pleasure's all mine. And uh, you're quite the world traveler. I saw you just got back from Vegas. Yes. Uh, one of my least favorite locations in the, in the world, actually. I, uh, I grew up uh, right outside Atlantic City. So casinos are like not a very big boo-hoo-hoo attraction to me. And you'll find out like a lot of my not so good years revolve around the Atlantic City area. So for me, like going to Vegas, was just like, you know, I go there for business and then I'm, I'm out on a red eye as soon as I can leave. <laughs> yeah, I was there uh, just just the other day and uh, I guess a couple months ago, but I, I didn't have the same experience when I, I went the first time, maybe like eight years ago. I uh, I went with my dad and and uh, I was in I was blacked out in a uh, poker tournament. I forgot that I played in and won and paid for the whole trip. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so nice. let's get into yeah, it. I did that with poker too. I did. I think I, I, I poker afforded me like six years of of doing the not right thing. So, hey, you know, <laughs> when you're good, you're good, right? <laughs> so, so let's get into it. Could you tell us about uh, your journey and what led you to get sober in 2014? Yeah, absolutely. So, oof. we were just talking about this. Uh, a couple of seconds ago, like I never know what I'm going to say in the beginning. And I think that's, I maybe should have, uh, prepared, but I, I know that, uh, the guy that took me through the steps, it's like, Hey, you know, you're talking about your sobriety and your journey. There's no reason to really prepare. You just kind of show up and let God take the wheel and go from there. So I didn't prepare anything. And my experience is just my experience, man. Um, you know, what led me to, to get sober in 2014 was the fact that I was probably going to die if I didn't, you know, I like, uh, I like to drink like a lot, uh, and other things, but mainly, you know, uh, alcohol was a big part of my story. It, uh, it led me to make a lot of poor decisions, you know, when I was actively drinking and, uh, you know, it led me to a lot of misery um, when I wasn't drinking. You know, I, I just didn't think that uh, there was a way to to have a life that uh, you could be sober and enjoy it. And it just didn't make sense to me, like going to the mall or going grocery shopping or just doing anything normal, not, you know, three sheets to the wind. It just, I was like, wow, that's, you know, that's worse than death, you know, until that not becomes the truth until like your drinking takes you um, or your, your, you know, narcotics or, or drug abuse, like takes you to, um, to that level. And in 2014, like that's, that's kind of where I, I found myself, man, is, uh, you know, I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired, I guess is, is what they say as much as I dislike the, uh, <laughs> the one liner phrases of, of 12 step recovery. Uh, it's, you know, there's a lot of truth to it. And yeah, I, I did. I just got sick sick and tired of being sick and tired. So, uh, my options at that point were, uh, to be dead or to try something different. And I decided to try something different with the promise that if it didn't work out well for me, I would just pretty much be dead. 
So I, I didn't really have much to lose. And I think a lot of people that come into 12 step programs, like that's pretty much it. It's like, well, I didn't really have shit to lose. I don't know if I can curse on this or not, or you guys can bleep it out. But, uh, yeah, yeah, you can do whatever the F you want. <laughs> awesome. I'm going to take my shirt off then. Wait, you said Hell yeah. audio, right? Yeah. <laughs> was that's it? It's like in the, it was in the office where Andy was like, I'm cutting off Phyllis's head with a chainsaw. <laughs> Dwight, put your shirt back on. <laughs> All right, I'm going to keep my shirt on, then. but for an extra $2, we'll send you the video footage of this. <laughs> Ooh, behind the scenes, I'll set up a membership group where you get to watch it. Oh, uh, yeah, that'll be great. <laughs> yeah. So... So drugs and alcohol bring you to your knees. What's what was the last straw? What was just the I can't keep doing this anymore? Well, since it's uh, since it's getting close to Mother's Day, you know, and we talked about our mothers before this, I, I think it was just like really, you know, letting my mom down, man. I know that sounds so corny, but if you knew this woman and you knew what she went through uh, and how tough she was, uh, and just you know just what a phenomenal person that she is. Uh, I just hated letting her down, man. And uh, there were times where I would get better. Uh, and like we do, like most of uh, the real alcoholics do, when we get better, uh, you know, it's like a, we're up, we're like a rocket of upward mobility. And then all of a sudden, you know, we, you know, come in contact with this fallacy of we're doing this ourselves, you know, we're, we're self made sober people, you know, um, and we're fixing ourselves and, uh, you know, we, th we think that we can take a drink like, Hey, I did all this fixing and, uh, you know, maybe it's cool if I just, if I just have another one, maybe it'll be different this time. And then, uh, that would happen occur in my brain and, and like, like an idiot, I would black out, uh, you know, of all my previous experiences with, uh, with drugs and alcohol, uh, for the, this concept of, you know, I can do it right this time. And, uh, then, you know, this allergic reaction would happen. Like they talk about in 12 step fellowship where my body would demand more drugs and alcohol, but I wasn't drinking and, and, you know, or using like a normal person. And then I'd find myself, you know, busted it out. And, you know, like my family would be disappointed again, man. And I just, I just didn't want to continue to put them through that because even though I couldn't stop drinking and using, uh, I did love my family. You know, I love my mother. I love my father. I love my sister. I love my aunts and uncles. You know, I just had a lot of love for people. And uh, my, my changing point was when I thought to myself, like, maybe I should, you know, not be in this world and that life would be easier for my loved ones uh, if I wasn't there. You know, it's a, it's a tough spot to be in. And, uh, you know, a lot of people will go down that road, you know, out of selflessness, but, you know, that's, that was my, my changing point, man. Like when I found myself in that state of mind, it was a, it was a rough state of mind, man. You know, I don't wish that upon anybody, but that's, um, that's what it took for me to get sober. You know, um, it wasn't homelessness. I'd seen that, uh, it wasn't, uh, you know, my family forced me to go to a treatment facility because my family had experience with, you know, addiction. I um, come from like an Irish and Scottish family, man. So we're no stranger to drinking and, and addiction problems. Just didn't want to hurt anybody else anymore, man. That, that was probably my turnaround is when I, I hit that. So. so 2014, you're getting sober. Is it easy at first or are you struggling getting up, getting down? What's the beginning look like for you? So was it easy at first? I guess my, just my experience with it was, was that it was easy for me. Right. Because I had waited until my life was such a massive mess. Like I, I got sober at 30 years old. Right. I didn't want to go into uh, the rooms of these 12 step programs. I didn't want anything to do with it. Like I knew what happened in those rooms. I knew people uh, stopped drinking and, and getting stoned in those rooms. And I didn't want that. I, I wanted nothing to do with that. As a matter of fact, I was like, keep all that in those rooms and I'm not going to walk in there. And so that was my only option. Uh, so for me, I got a hold of, uh, of a guy who just told me a story and uh, I was just amazed at his story because it sounded a lot like my story. Right. 
Uh, and then he started to tell me about what happened in his story, which sounded a lot like what happened to me. Like, Hey, I didn't want to hurt anybody anymore. So I figured that, you know, maybe I would just take myself out of the equation so that my family would uh, be better off. And then, uh, then he told me another part, which kind of blew my mind. It was the part that I didn't really believe in too much. It was a part of, you know, him not having a drink for the past five years. And I was like, that's, you know, that's impossible. Didn't really force it down my throat. He didn't really uh, tell me this is how it has to be. I, you know, I approached him and I was like, you know, you're a cool guy. How'd you get so cool? And he's just like, ha, I'm not really that cool. This is how I did it. Yeah, he was, he was a fun guy too. He didn't, I, when I approached him, he wasn't just like, Oh, you're sick. This is sad. He's like, look at this sick bastard right here. Look at this guy. You know, like he was, he was, he was, he was a funny guy. He had a smile on his face. He hugged me and, uh, yeah, I wanted it. And, and that's really what happened is I got exposed to this in a, in a very good light. And, you know, he worked me through a 12 step program quickly. It wasn't like, Hey, take all the time that you need to do this. It was, let's go now because I don't know if you're going to survive like the next couple of days. And that's what it was. It was like, you're drowning. You need this. You, you know, your arm is lobbed off. You need to have a tourniquet and you need it applied like an hour ago, but the next best time to do it is right now. So let's do it. You know, that, that's what happened. He ripped me through the steps. Like it says, um, in a particular piece of, of literature of a anonymous program that we want to talk about, <laughs> it says we launched into a course of vigorous action, you know, and that's exactly what we did. You know, it wasn't like, you just take your time. It was like, dude, now go make it happen. Yeah. That's one of my biggest gripes against. And I mean, you know, everybody's story is different. Everybody's journey is different, but like I, I've heard people picking up year medallions being like, yeah, I took my time and that's, that's what worked for me. And I mean, I, I can't say to whether or not something works or doesn't work, but I mean, if you're sick, should you take your time and getting better or, you know, the whole disease is centered around you want instant gratification. Mm -hmm. What is the downside to getting the instant gratification the way that it was originally intended to be. And then you help other people. And then the altruism is part of what keeps you sober longer, longer down the road. Not this, well, you know, you're, <laughs> you're sick and you need things immediately. So to stop you from getting your instant gratification, we're going to make this as long and painful as possible. Yeah. And, and I mean, I see the merit of like, you're not going to get this immediately. You have to want it. You have to earn it. But at the same time, like, okay, what if you die before, before that happens? It's just, well, he didn't want it bad enough. And I, I don't really subscribe to the kind of cop out that has been going around for a while of, oh, well, if someone dies or someone relapses, it's not your fault. They weren't willing. And okay, there's an ounce of truth to that. But at the same time, like if your responsibility is to help somebody else, how is that just not part of part of the deal? Like it just, it doesn't really make sense to me how, how we've kind of twisted it into that. And nowhere is that really talked about in 12 step literature. I mean, they say if he disappears, like don't go hunting him down, like find sure. someone who's willing, but but that idea, you, oh yeah, it took me a year to do my fourth step and that's what I needed. No, that's BS, man. You, you didn't need that. You just felt like chilling and doing absolutely nothing because mm -hmm. anybody who's been sober can tell you like yeah. you can do it in an afternoon and like done forever. Like you keep going on and I mean, it's like an ever evolving piece of work and stuff, but like it's, it's an afternoon. It's, it's not a several month program. It's an afternoon, like worst case a weekend. Yeah. Like if you're, if you're extreme, but like it's a couple hours, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. And you know, it, like for, uh, for my personal experience too, again, like totally blessed, um, not just for uh, the sponsor I had that took me through the program, but also some of the men that he introduced me to. Like they, you know, they laid it down for me. They said like, you know, the reason we're taking you through the steps is not to help you, man. It's so that 
you can help other people. And through helping other people, you will have helped yourself. Like that's how it was laid out for me is like, we're ripping you through the steps, uh, you know, basically like putting a rifle in your hand and sending you out to the front lines because like, that's, what's going to keep you alive. You know, it's not going to be you know, sitting back here in in the rear. Like this is where, you know, this is where people die. So you want to get up front and helping people. And that's, man, that's what we did. I mean, I, I can remember being in a, um, you know, being in a, uh, being 30 years old, man, and, and living in a house with eight other guys um, that were all on the same path as me. And I'm college educated. I'm honorably discharged from the United States military. And here I am like in a house with a bunch of dudes riding a bike. And it's just like, if that's not humility, like I don't, you know, I don't know what really is, but uh, that was humility for me. Uh, but I was also extremely grateful, you know? So you said to kind of come f- full circle, you said, was it difficult for you? I don't think it was difficult because I knew that if it didn't work, like I was going to go with plan B and plan B was like to check out. Right. So I really did, um, you know, go 110% with it. Uh, I screwed up a gazillion times. I did, you know, amends wrong. I, you know, um, did, um, I did a bunch of things wrong, man. Uh, but once I found out that they were wrong and my sponsor told me that they were wrong or my sober support network told me they were wrong, I fixed them, you know, and I think I conduct myself the same way, you know, in business too, is like, I, you know, I would rather uh, have like imperfect action or in the military, we called it violent action. Just, just do it. Just get out there and do it and F up and then we'll fix it. But you know, better to do that than to sit on the sidelines and just constantly map something out and then just never do it, which I feel like, you know, there are a lot of people, you know, uh, in our like age group, even like in their thirties or younger too, that just do that, man. They just sit there and they just, they just watch and don't do shit you know and yeah not. or they'll spin their wheels just going in circles something to the effect of oh well i got 70 new followers on instagram like i'm really building my business and it's like no you're not how much money did you make like that's that's the you know okay there's something to be said for for having people following you and liking your page and that's da, da, da. okay part of part of the plan but you know no one's no one's really, no one's buying groceries with likes. No. no one's, that's not actual currency. That's, that's a representation and a reward for spinning your wheels playing on Facebook. But end of the day, if they're not turning into paying clients, you, you don't have a business. You're just playing on Facebook and getting likes on a page that you called a business. Like that's, that's what a lot of people do. And mm-hmm. it's crazy to me. I was, um, he didn't become a client. He wasn't in any position to, um, to really move forward. But, and I forget who the, the person was, but he, he basically he was like, oh yeah, this influencer followed me on LinkedIn. And I was like, um, okay, so like, are you working out a deal with him or something? He's like, no, but now he's going to see my posts. And I was like, I don't do business with people just because I see their post and like, wh- what, what? that doesn't mean anything. Someone followed you on LinkedIn. That's, that's all that that means. Like, you know, if, if you reached out to him and you messaged him and he messaged you back and you guys sat down, got coffee, like that would be moving the needle. But he was under the impression that, well, this guy follows me on LinkedIn. Therefore my business is really taking off. No. And that's the delusion a lot of people have. Yeah. So what would you say is a, is a better barometer of, (laughs) <laughs> of actual success in a business, just the action? Uh, I think you can gauge success of a business by going to your client base, right? And seeing how many people that you've helped, you know, kind of like you can gauge the success of a human being's life by looking at how many people that they've loved on and, and assisted. That's how I would gauge it. You know, go to your customer service aspect of your company and pull out, you know, all the hate mail and bullshit and everything come through it and and see how heavy the flow is. If it's super heavy and you're not doing anything about it, then your business sucks and it's not going to be around for long. But that's an area of my company that I tend to, to live in. You know, it's like, you know, feedback, feedback, feedback. Like we don't have a hundred percent retention rate. Surprise anyone that's listening to this. You know, we've lost clients. Uh, we've 
identified people that we thought would be a good fit for our service, but it turned out that they weren't a good fit for the service. You know, and we're learning. Uh, the business has been in operation for like six or seven months, I think. And like two of those months was just me solo, which I don't even know if you want to count those months, but we can because I spent a lot of time <laughs> awake and, and, you know, and working. But uh, I, I think, you know, what, what gauges a business, if you want a good business, a sustainable business is like, Hey man, like how good is your, your product to your clients? Like, are you just shoveling bullshit, you know, or are you, doing the real deal. I mean, like likes, who cares about likes? That's never done anything for me, you know? Yeah. I think it's just kind of the culture that we're brought up in that people, people believe that it actually means something. And then so many people believe it that when they hear it, other people saying it, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, and then I'm sure like I'll get an email from someone being like, you don't know anything. I've got 10 million likes and I made a billion dollars last year. Sure. I hate your podcast. Love Bill Gates. <laughs> so, so I mean, I, I know that you know your world in the lead gen marketing space. It's saturated with people that are mediocre at best. Mm -hmm. So what separates you, especially on the clients, when you knock it out of the park? And like you said, it's impossible to have 100% retention. But when you knock it out of the park, what's separating you from the 10 million other people claiming to do what you do? I think it's just, uh, I think it's, I think it's our, I don't think it is. I know it. I know it's our process. Uh, I know it's the customer service aspect of it. I, and I know it's the front end too, is it's the fact that, you know, we're not, uh, we're not a company that's going to ever have thousands of people that we're working with. We're more of a, let's stay a boutique level. Uh, let's, you know, handhold and give a ton of value to our clients in exchange for, you know, some, some valuable feedback and, and to grow the product. I mean, you know, it, guys that know me know that, uh, you know, I'm not the type of person that's going to walk around with a Rolex and a Ferrari, right? Like that doesn't mean as much to me as having meaningful conversations, you know, with people turning my, my quote unquote clients into friends. Like that's the stuff that fills me up. That's the stuff that I like, you know, I don't get a good feeling when I can't get a client results. You know, I, I, I hate it. Uh, cause it, it's not their fault. Um, I look at it as my fault. Like what didn't I do? And sometimes it might've been just like, Hey, the sales training that I have for my guys was off. And we identified someone as a potential candidate for our program who was not a potential candidate. Like that's not their fault. It's my fault. And if I can continue and I can teach my staff to continue, uh, to take accountability for themselves and their actions and their decisions, you know, I think we got something good. But if I can't, you know, then, you know, I don't have a company. I just have like an unchained dog that's just running around the yard, like just going insane. So, um, you know, I, I think that's what separates me is just like our company culture, you know, how we look at our clients uh, and then, you know, the processes that we have to ensure that they're successful. I love that you touched on the accountability aspect because, there's so many times where companies, when they fail to perform, which it can happen. I mean, it's part of any operation that has human beings and human beings are susceptible to error, mm. be it intentional, unintentional, best intentions, bad intentions, whatever the case is. But taking that ownership as the top level, as the top of the company to say, you know, even if I'm doing everything in my power, if my employees are acting a certain way, if my clients are getting a certain type of result that I'm not trying to get for them, like that all rises and falls on your shoulders as the owner. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you know, I wasn't there that day and this person did this and they should have known that they shouldn't do that. And as, as tough of a pill as it is to swallow, like it all rises and falls on the leader of the company. It's not the employees. It's not the customers. There's bits and pieces here and there. But I mean, if people are responding a certain way and that's not the way that you want them to respond, it's most likely somewhere in the past 
they have behaved that way and it was either not addressed. So it's a passive aggressive buildup Mm -hmm. or it was addressed and not followed up on. And I mean, I'm far from perfect in this area. Just like, as I'm saying it, I'm just thinking like, okay, yeah, my staff, like I yelled at like three people yesterday for some stupid stuff that happened. And it's like, yeah, Andrew and whose fault was that? But it's, it's true though. It's ours, man. It's the, it's the ugly side of, uh, of, I guess being a entrepreneur and 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 a business owner is like, you know, just extreme accountability, you know, that they have. You were saying you're listening to Jocko extreme ownership while you're in the gym. And how's that hitting you? I thank God every day. Like I talk about my mom a lot. Like I'm going to go ahead and if you haven't figured out, I'm like a big family guy. I'll talk about my dad. My dad was hard ass. This guy was a fucking hard ass, man. Um, and I would, I very much did not enjoy his presence for a long time in life until I became an adult. And I remember him, you know, dropping me off and just being like, Hey man, like, you know, good luck in school, good luck in college. Like now I'm, you know, I'm still your father, but now we can be friends. Cause like I gave you everything, you know, I gave you everything I could. And it's up to you to take it the rest of the way. Now, man, you're, you're a grown ass man. Good luck. Uh, but he, you know, it's a hard ass man. Uh, and like, he definitely 100% like drove home in our brains. Like, you know, like take ownership. Like take ownership for shit. You know, it's not anybody else's fault, but yourself, you know, like, like pony up for it. Um, and, you know, and, and growing up in this little town in, in New Jersey, you know, like a lot of the guys that I grew up al- alongside of me, like that wasn't their households, man. But for, for me, it was just like, I grew up tough. It was tough. You know, it was, um, you know, take ownership for it, you know, like manual labor. I did a lot of manual labor. Uh, it was, it was the options were manual labor or, or read your math book. You know, I did a post on that, like probably like six months ago. I just thought that shit was normal. And I was telling somebody about it. And they're like, that's not normal. And I was like, Oh, well, I'm going to make a post about it and kind of like relay, you know, the, my dad into it and the type of person that I am. And, uh, and people are like, wow, it's amazing, man. You know, but he would say it all the time. He's like, listen, I'm, I'm going to leave you one day and you'll either be the best ditch digger in New Jersey or be the best mathematician. He's like, but you'll never go hungry. And I hate that shit, man. I hated it. But like getting into even the military and like seeing, you know, like that other people were, were soft to a degree, you know? And, and I was just sitting there and like, man, all these dudes can yell at us. Like they can't like slap us across the face or hit us with a bell or, you know, crack me across the face like this is awesome this is gonna be so much easier than (laughs) (laughs) what a vacation (laughs) i know it's gonna be easy i'm already doing push-ups and running anyway like that's that's normal day and like you know and the yelling is nor that's how we communicate at the dinner table like wait like you know i can't get anything thrown at me or slapped and, and you know like don't anybody on this on listening to this don't ever feel bad for me. I deserve every slap across the face that I got, you know. <laughs> Definitely a button pusher for sure. Like, don't do that. I'm like, well, I'm gonna fucking do that. I'm gonna F and do that. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah, that was a tangent. I'm sorry, I went off. No, no, it's all good. Are there any other uh audiobooks that have had an influence on you, like uh extreme ownership? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, I mesh it up between, and so I used to have a commute, but now, you know, one of the great things about working for our company is that, you know, we have remote locations, so you can work, like I said, see a lot of my travel stuff. I like to work in different countries. Uh, I like to go all over the world. And as long as I bring a laptop, it's fired up and me and, and my entire staff can conduct business, uh, on behalf of our clients. But, um, you know, uh, Tim Ferriss four hour work week was just an absolute game changer to me. Um, the only other book that probably changed my life as much as that is the blue one that you and I both know about. Uh, you, Michael Gerber, um, a good friend of mine, Tim, uh, Stadzi, if anybody knows him, he's also a, a business owner. He uh, recommended a, a book called, uh, the E-Myth Revisited. Yes, sir. And I, I'm so grateful that I read that before I started this endeavor because it really like changed my mindset from like a worker bee mindset, which my business would have failed if that was if what it was to like an entrepreneur. It's like 
hey man, like you have to get outside of your business and look at it as a whole and like realize that you're going to have different divisions of the business, you know, marketing, sales, fulfillment, account management, um, billing, human resources. And like your job, you know, is going to, at one point you'll be in those divisions. You'll be the only one, but it's important for you to develop these standard operating procedures and then put bodies into those standard operating procedures, make them like a living standard operating procedure uh, so that your company can, can grow. Otherwise you're going to stifle growth. And, you know, I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs today and try to get them to read that book. And I know people hate to read nowadays, but I mean, like, God, that saved me so much headache. Cause if I was still doing everything by myself right now, I would be losing my mind. Yeah. Those it's crazy. Like the, <laughs> your, your recommendations are, literally like on my, uh, I have on, on my site, there's the URL. It's lisiscoaching.com slash Rex R A C S. And it's got basically like a laundry list of audiobooks and recommendations and things like that. Tim Ferriss, four hour work week. I would probably point as like the book I recommend the most and Michael Gerber, EMF revisited as also that in the same sentence, what two do I recommend Four hour work week <laughs> and e revisited and for different reasons. And just, you know, for people that, that aren't familiar, basically four hour work week, it's the idea of if you're very productive, you can do, it's not just, Oh, well I worked for four hours and then chilled the rest of the day, but you find yeah. where you're productive and then you put energy into that. And delegate the rest of the BS, which goes hand in hand with the e-myth of have systems in place for other people to do the BS on your plate so that yeah. so you can do the things that are important to growing your business. I know for myself, man, like that's one of the biggest things that I touch on when I'm working one-on-one -on -one with like business coaching with clients is getting drilled into their brain that you are a business owner. You are not the guy who fixes computers. You are not the guy who builds websites. You are a business owner and your product is that stuff that you used to do and you used to trade all of your time so that you could get money. But now you're in the business of trading money for other people's time and making sure that you have enough money to sustain other people to be holding on to their paychecks as well as keeping your clients happy. And you're no longer playing the game of how do I make more money? Work more hours. That's that's the mindset we've been brought up in. You're supposed to get a good job and you know, you work work hard. You can work overtime and get time and a half, but you're capped at the number of hours in a day. But when you play the role of a business owner and you can multiply, okay, I have one salesman and my net revenue is like $500 per week off of one salesman. How do I make more money? Mm. If I hire 10 more salesmen and I have all the processes and everything in place, that's a good way to 10X your revenue, but you still have to be able to scale. And how do you scale? You have processes in place. How do you have processes in place? Do your job and write down what you do and then give it to somebody that doesn't know how to do your job and have them follow along. That's been one of the best ways that I've done training is just here is a piece of paper of what I think is a good enough description, like an 80, 20, like here's 80% of, you know, I don't have like details, like line by line, by line, by line, by line of every single nuance. But the idea of here is the big picture, follow this. And if they can follow it for the most part, it gets rid of, it gets rid of the issues of why didn't you reply to this email? Oh, I didn't know I was suppo supposed to reply to the email. Well, if we have in place, when there's an upset customer that emails, here is how you handle it. Accountability, like all these things. And it's kind of obvious when you hear people talking about it. And I know for myself, I, I knew that idea, but I was kind of in the mindset of this isn't actually a real business. It's just me fixing computers in my halfway house. So, yeah. so, so it was, it was a different mindset and that's, that's all I knew. So when you started, uh, Dawn Patrol, were you just like, 
I'm a business owner right off the bat? Or was it, was it kind of a learning experience to be like, I'm doing all of the work now. How do I let go some of this responsibility and let other people handle some of it? So I, again, man, I, everything that I've, I've done, like how I know I'm, I'm doing the right thing in life is uh, by how, how much I have to wrestle with the idea of doing it. Now that doesn't mean like, Hey, you know, everything in my life I know is right because it's easy because it's definitely not easy, but it's like wrestling with the idea of like going down a certain route. Like if I have to wrestle with something a lot, like wrestle with like, you know, like, Hey, is it good for me to go here? Should I be living here? Should I be living with her or whatever the case is? Like, if it's, if it's a wrestle, I know it's not good. And if it's, you know, if it's fluid, but I'm like, Hey, there's a lot of work in front of me. Like I go for it. And that's kind of like what it was like, um, with my business mentors and relationships that I had as well. So funny story, uh, the guy that, um, the guy that I got into marketing with initially, uh, you know, was like, was like a, a, about a decade sober. Right. Like I, uh, I submitted a form online to be part of a community of, of marketers and, uh, and business owners. Uh, and the last question on the form, uh, so that I would have the opportunity to pay to get into this group was what's the hardest thing that you've ever done in your life. And I put getting sober was tough, right. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do. And I immediately got a phone call and the guy called me and said, Hey, I just want to let you know, like this, this guy, you know, he's been sober for a decade. And I was like, I was totally sold at that point. I was like, take, I was like, I need to get in this group. I need to be in it. It's a visa card. Let me know when you're ready. Like, let's, let's run this. Uh, and then just like meeting him and like meeting other people that, you know, were 10 steps ahead of me and were willing to, to give back so long as like I was willing to do the work and then also, you know, as this like group of guys together, like turn around and provide value and like give my time back and be like, Hey guys, like I'm a split testing company or I'm doing something with marketing or I'm trying something with my operations procedures. You should do it too. It wasn't difficult for me because I was still at my previous company dad a lot when I was reading um, the book uh, by Michael Gerber, right? The E-Myth Revisited. So I'm reading this E-Myth Revisited. I'm watching these guys actively carry it out you know, and I'm, I'm talking to guys like in tech fields that are like, Hey, in six months or less, I could totally be removed for a company and have it self-sustaining. And I'm like, what, how do you do that? You know, because Tim Ferriss's book was the first one I read. So I was very interested in, you know, automating companies. And, uh, you know, we use a lot of virtual assistants, you know, in, uh, central and South America and out in the Philippines who are phenomenal. They're phenomenal guys and, and we pay them well i pay them really good wages um, for where they're at in the world and it works for us and it works for them and uh you know it's it's great man it wasn't it wasn't difficult for me to remove myself because from day one that's the goal and it's it's still the goal man it's like now that i'm the coo of the company i'm trying to figure out how i can become the ceo and what's even entailed in the ceo's job you know uh, and then I'm trying to figure out like how to, you know, boost myself out of my company because successful guys, it, it drives me nuts. They're not just like, Hey, uh, I'm the business owner of this. They're like, I'm the business owner of 15 friggin' businesses. I'm on the board of directors. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And you're just like, how are you able to accomplish that? Like when, you know, I have one job, I'm a sales guy. I'm, you know, totally comp sales guy. And I'm, you know, I'm working 70 hours a week because I'm, just have this fire in me where I got to sell. And they're like, you need to find someone else to do it for you. Or you need to learn to teach guys to do it. Or you need to learn, you know, how to manage guys and, and build a business off of it. So for me, dude, it wasn't difficult because I, I knew that was the goal from day one. It's like, I wouldn't be able to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish without, without help. So it wasn't tough for me, man, I guess. That's so cool that your experience coming into it, very different than a lot of people that you understood that you have to run a business and not just own a job. Like there's, it's funny, you know, the, the dream job when you're a kid, it's like, Oh, you should be a doctor or, or a lawyer. And I kind of think about it 
And like when you were saying like, oh, these people have like four companies or 13 companies, you said, and I was like, I only have four, <laughs> but, <laughs> but like the idea of a doctor or a lawyer, I mean, you're trading your time for money. And I mean, if you, if you mm-hmm. own a practice and you have other people working with you and I, I work, well, one of my clients is a doctor, one of my business coaching clients. And when I had introduced the idea of you should build it up and have people work for you, train people, think of what you'd be able to accomplish with this time and this time. And he was just like, but when I make less money and then we sat down and did the math and I was like, no, you make a lot more money and you do less work if you run it the right way. And he was just like, but that doesn't make sense. Like if I am not the one doing all the work, how is it possible that I make more money? And I was like, that is the secret to all business ever. Mm. (laughs) It's like, you can make more money if you just put in the effort to make a good system and make sure that they're good enough metrics that you can make sure that your system is still working well and that your people are still Mm -hmm. working well. I mean, you had touched on, like you travel all the time. Like I travel all the time. And when I see how much you travel, I think, man, I wish I could travel as much as Bill can. (laughs) (laughs) Like it's, I only show you all the glorious stuff, man. Trust me. There's a lot of like in January when we were, I mean, we blew up almost our company blew up almost 360% in less than 30 days. It was, it was excessive. Uh, and I'm in Bali and, uh, I'm 13 hours ahead of U S and most of our business is going to be, you know, located in central or Eastern time zones. Right. And, uh, it was, you know, so I'm working from 6 PM at night till seven o'clock in the morning. I get off at seven. I go surf. I go eat breakfast, ride my scooter around uh, a little bit until I'm just like, yo, I I need to go to sleep, sleep through the days. And then on the weekends, you know, we would travel places and do fun stuff. But, uh, you know, like I I was grinding in, in Bali. I was grinding out big time, hiring people, developing the SOPs. And again, like imperfect action, you know, we would make SOPs, we'd run the VAs through it, they would jack stuff up, we'd be like, nope, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's our fault. You did exactly what we told you to do. Now we know we need to tweak it. And we tweaked it and tweaked it and tweaked it. until you know, we got it to a nice sustainable point, And we got the right people in it. We're always looking for, you know, additional people. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we got it to a nice sustainable amount. Uh, and it was, it's been, it's been awesome. And I've been able to kind of step away more and more and more to like a higher level where like, you know, we're now, now we're, you know, we're heavy on marketing. You know, we didn't do too much marketing initially. Uh, it's funny. I, I would tell everyone, it's like, yeah, you know, we s- scaled up, uh, you know, a Facebook ad agency, um, to, you know, over six figures a month. And we didn't have to, you know, even spend two pennies on boosting an ad that I like, had you do it. And I was like, outbound dialers, you know, sales guys, that's pretty much what we did sales guys. And then organically through Facebook and like, wow, that's, that's crazy. But now we're starting to like get into that realizing like, yeah, maybe, you know, we should do something besides just outbound harass people. (laughs) Yeah. Well, there's, there's something to be said too, for having more legs on the stool to keep it up because I know just in my own experience, like with um with rush tech like we've reinvented ourselves probably five different times of just completely different marketing and you know what works one day you can just wake up the next day some algorithm changes something is on the news something can just shift overnight and i i hate seeing the businesses that are they say like, oh, well, I don't need to market my business. All we do is word of mouth and that's perfect. And to an extent, like that's great that you're getting that. But what happens when just say you don't close the next round of leads, right? Your your referrals that came in, are you going to keep hitting up your existing clients? Say, hey, I need more and more referrals because this is my only point of 
getting new customers. Oh, sorry, we're out. Yeah. Well, so then you're just out the end. You you can't get any more customers. And I mean, I've I've seen it happen countless times. Like one algorithm change in Facebook and something that was converting at excuse me, at something converting at like a dollar a lead jumps to $150 a lead because now you can't use this word anymore or this image now has text in it that violates this policy. Like it's so fragile that if your marketing yep. is dependent on just one thing. And one of the things that I, I wanted to touch on, so I, I was reading through some of your posts and how you kind of, you, you, Walk the reader through it. I'm assuming you do email marketing with with this copy. I'm just going to assume that. But you do something along mm. the lines of, like, I saved $1 on, on water by not getting bottled water versus tap water. And now I've spent $30 on bathroom <laughs> accessories because I tried to save $1 and ruined everything. That's why you should hire somebody to do your marketing for you. I'm going to assume like the meta, like that's your marketing of your marketing is how you uh, tell stories and like relate them. Yeah, pretty much, man. I like to, I like to, tell stories and people will say like, Oh, is that a, you know, a true story is some of the stuff and which is a fair question. And my response sometimes will be like, dude, it's true. You know, that it is a story. <laughs> you know, that's the truth of it. You know, you have to kind of peel it apart and figure it out. But that story was absolutely true. You know, I was uh, there with a, a good friend of mine, uh, Pat. And uh, I think we were like at a nice place and they call in Costa Rica, they don't call it tap water because they know they can't say that shit. They'll call it house water. They're like, do you want this, this, the bottled water or the house water? And I'm like, house water is fine. You know, so I have this house water at this fancy restaurant and I'm like, like, I can handle this, right? I'm spending all this money on water, you know, like I'm spending all this money on food, but the one thing I can't stand is spending a dollar on water i'm like that's ridiculous there's no i don't drink bottled water at home and drink it out of a cup you know like we're fine and uh and we went to this they call these roadside eateries they call them sodas in costa rica so if you ever hear the terminology soda and they and by they call them uh warungs i'm probably butchering how to say that but it's basically just like a roadside place like you get a meal it's cheap uh and uh you know, you'll get some local fare there. It's really good. My, my rule of thumb has always been this, that if there's a lot of people there, a lot of locals and a lot of non-locals, like it's probably safe. I, that's one of my big things. Uh, and then like, make sure that the person's not collecting the cash and handling the food. Uh, and then, you know, just make sure that a lot of these places, they'll, you know, they'll cook it in front of you, you know? So this hit all of the things as it was going to be okay. So I, you know, I got a Coke and I got a glass of water and I was extremely thirsty. I pounded the water. Everything was fine. And then we got on a speedboat from Jaco in Costa Rica to St. Teresa. And like halfway through this uh, speedboat, like I it hit my stomach and we were in the middle of the water. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> and I was very uncomfortable very uncomfortable until we hit uh, the first stop, which was Montezuma. And then we took a bus from Montezuma, uh, Montezuma to Santa Teresa in Costa Rica. And uh, man, that was tough. It was a really bumpy road. It was not a good show for me or for my friend Patrick. Uh, and we had to go see doctors, which I found out I totally got shim shammed on that deal because I brought this like bullshit looking uh, prescription to the pharmacy. And these girls just laughed at me. They're like, yeah, like you could have just came here and got this shit. Just tell us, tell us what's wrong with you. So it was just like this dude in an office. I knew it was so shady because there was no one there. It was just me. He's like, oh, I want to take your blood. I'm like, dude, you're not taking my blood. I'm like, you know what's wrong with me? I'm like, give me the antibiotics. And he's like, well, he put like a stethoscope on my heart. I'm like, what are you doing, man? Like I drank the water. I'm sick. I can't stop shitting. I want to vomit all over the place. I'm like, just give me what you give people for travelers diarrhea. And if it doesn't work, like I'll come back. So he's like, all right, fine. It's a hundred dollars USD though, to see me. And I was like, oh, fine. Oh, so I got shamed out of a hundred bucks, but in the end I got the antibiotics and then 
I was good to go in the next one. Hey, you know what though? It's like one of those things where someone may be like listening to this and like, Oh, I love that story of like saving a dollar and how all these things (laughs) happened. Like I want you to write my email copy for me, but people, people really do connect though. When you tell a story and then you can relate it, come back to what, um, what the people like, what your product is, what your service is like in, in our company's uh, drip emails, like when people sign up, we send them emails and it basically, it's like kind of pulling, pulling back the curtain of like behind the scenes of, Hey, you're here now in 2019 and this is what the company looks like. But if you were one of the brave souls that was trying this out five years ago, like this is what happened. Like I was so afraid that people would find out that I was the only employee. And when people would call and be like, are you the only one that works here? I would just say, no, we have like dedicated account managers and that way you get like the best service possible. And they're like, Oh, that's a great idea. And, but now like we do have dedicated account managers as a result of back then I was just trying to like put up this facade that I was bigger than I was. And, and now it's like, Hey, you know, people really liked that. And so we took that idea and ran with it. And now even though we've got this many people working with us now, you still get that one-on-one experience just like the people used to have, but you also get it with all these extra resources and all these new features and technologies changed over the last five years. So it it looks nothing like it used to, but people, people, they like those stories. Like I get responses from the emails and I think it's funny that they like reply to, to automatically send emails and they're like, great story. I love this. I love your company. <laughs> and like, I, I just, it's not too often that I'll send an email to a, um, to something that I know is automated, but what I'm starting to find in actually getting, um, like authors and I've got, by the time this episode will get aired, I've got like a ton of authors with like big followings and stuff coming up on the show and like getting through to them. Sometimes it's just like, I'll sign up on their email list and then just reply because like someone had to write it and like someone sometimes replies to the autoresponder and like, I've gotten in touch with people that way and they're like, Hey man, like sure. Like I'll, I'll send them a message on, on Facebook, send them a message on LinkedIn and reply to a, to an, automatic email, like join their email list. And I I'm getting in touch with influencers that are just like way beyond who I thought I'd be able to get in touch with. And it's, it's like, you know, you just got to kind of think outside the box. And I think th- though coming back around, like the telling of the stories, cause I always try to incorporate like, Hey, your message is to, achieve X, Y, and Z. And you can achieve that through this platform. And that's, that's really one of the things that I've like really discovered in the last, the last really like two months, like right around, like when, when I had first reached out to you, which is about two months ago and here we are, but like right around that time, it was like, how, how could I reach people that just aren't in my like, direct network or, you know, some people used to work for me and say, Hey, you got to get in touch with Bill. Like he's doing big things, which is really cool what you're doing. And it's crazy to see Thanks. too, like, you know, you're just, just threw this together and now you're crushing it. Like <laughs> when, when I was like six months and I had nothing to show for it. I, I, I was probably just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. My, my page has like 30 likes. <laughs> I just knew, I just knew I had to get a bunch of people around, man. Like when I started it, like, uh, I remember like the first couple of months, man, I started the business like a Kickstarter, man. I'm like, Hey, this is a concept. You can get on the ground floor level. I have nothing to deliver you for like two months. And people are like, yeah, all right. You did good work for us at the, at the company that you were at. Are you still there? I'm like, uh, kind of, <laughs> so don't tell anybody about it, you know? And, uh, it was great. And I used like every dime of that initial startup uh, to outfit troops and to attract guys, you know, to, to work not for, but like with me, you know, and, and like, it was, it was great. Like just like 
my this guy my my buddy gary you know he's like uh, the head of our account management department i mean the guy's like I, I love him to death you know i love working with him um he doesn't put his name behind bullshit he cares about you know our clients not my clients or his clients they're ours you know and uh nate you know our uh our sales director is just like they're just guys that um that won't do halfway shit and they're just guys that go all in on anything that they do whether they're sweeping the floor or whether they're trying to figure out a dynamic way of presenting our 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 clients with a, a better end product you know like how do we make it easy and we have these um we have these uh huddles every morning you know and, and at the close of business every morning each one of our divisions has a huddle they fill out a form. That form gets kicked up to all the other management. So everyone knows exactly what's going on in every other division. And then at the end, we have a leadership huddle where we pull it all together. You know, what's something short term that we can do to increase the effectiveness of our product uh, to our clients? And what's something long term that we can do to increase the effectiveness of our product? And like that way, you know, we're we're just trying to get it better, man, every single day. Like, what can we do for a big win in the next seven days? What we can we do for a big win in the next three months? And what are we doing now that's awesome that we don't want to stop doing? You know, and as long as we keep doing the good things and then keep on looking at the things we could be doing better, hiring better people, um, going from Facebook to YouTube to Google and, and like trying out different, you know, social media distribution networks, different, you know, search engines, you know, to drive traffic, you know, which one's going to give the most qualified traffic to our end user. It's uh, it tends to just keep getting better, man. And, you know, we're just, we're focused on more on the, the mastering the process than we are on like, Hey, like we made a bunch of money, you know, it's good when we look at the bank accounts and we're like, all right, cool. Like we can hire more awesome people. You know, we can, uh, we can buy this course that just came out for five grand that I think is going to be a game changer. Let's buy it and give it to our account managers, you know, this retention to profit course, or let's give, you know, this, uh, this YouTube course, you know, to our fulfillment department. So it's great. We're not just like making the product better, but we are teaching, you know, the people that work with us more so that they can get up and walk out of our place and get a job someplace for maybe twice as much as they're making with us. But our hope is, is that, you know, we have such a solid culture that they wouldn't want to get up and go anyplace else, you know? So. I love that perspective. I think it's uh, Richard Branson. He says, your employees aren't a liability. They're an asset. And mm -hmm. if you've got people that are doing the right thing time and time again, you know, I'm, and maybe to my, to my own uh, fault, but when they say like, oh, you shouldn't play favorites, like I look at that more as you should reward excellence and not treat everybody the same if everybody doesn't perform the same. Like the guy who shows up 30 minutes early, does training, gets on the phone, helps other people and doesn't ask for anything in return, stays late, will give up opportunities because he knows that someone else could use a win. Like I'm going to give that guy more opportunity than the guy who shows up, leaves early, complains, gets upset, can't control his temper, you know, and oh, you're playing favorites. Like I am rewarding on merit. Like I try mm -hmm. to take emotions, friendships, all these intangible business things out of the equation but like if you come in and perform and black and white metrics on numbers that matter if you go above and beyond i will reward you if if it's attention leads something that you need that's out of what we normally do i'm willing to do that for the people that are willing to put in not expecting anything else in return because I want that person to feel special. And if someone else sees the special treatment and gets upset by it, it's not, it's not just based on, well, that guy's my friend. It's well, that guy's, you know, the best salesman that's, he's yeah, he's yeah. giving you opportunities when it's in his best interest to hold on to that lead and call it an hour later after he gets off the phone with someone else. But 
you know, neither here nor yeah. there. It's just, I know people have said, well, you play favorites and I, I've got black and white numbers and metrics of why I give attention and rewards to people who earn it, not to people who I like people who earn it. Mm-hmm. So Bill, in wrapping up, what, what advice would you give to somebody who's still struggling with addiction, drinking, trying to get out of it? What would you say is like the best piece of advice that you would give to someone who's interested in stopping using? Uh, man. I was at a, a, a meeting. It was a, a meeting. I was watching a good friend of mine, uh, he awarded a four year medallion. And, uh, at that meeting, there was a guy that, that came up, uh, that came up to the stage, uh, and he was awarding, I guess, another guy like a 10 year medallion or something. And he said, uh, he said a lot of things. Uh, but one thing that stood out to me, is he said that there's nothing, there's nothing wrong that you can say to someone who's ready to get sober. And there's nothing right that you can say to someone who isn't ready to get sober. So what I would say to someone who's considering it is that when you're ready, we're here. That's That's so good. And now same question, but geared towards someone who's trying to make the jump into entrepreneurship. What would you say is the best piece of advice? I follow your heart, man. That's it. You know, I, uh, I, went back and forth if I should, if I should leave my job or not. Like I, I was doing well, uh, at that a lot. Like, uh, I had for the first time, like cracked into six figures, a yearly salary. I don't have a wife. I don't have a kid. Um, I already had toys, like a truck, a Harley surfboards, like a place on the beach. So like I was doing all right monetarily, but, uh, I couldn't pick like who I wanted to work with, where I wanted to work, when I wanted to work. And after reading Tim Ferriss's book, like I was like, man, that would be awesome if I could do that, man. If I could do my job from Costa Rica or from Bali or from Thailand or the Dominican Republic or Colombia, like that would be my dream. Uh, and, you know, like, like what I would say is, is, uh, is you know, like, like talk to people. And, and write a letter, man. Like my, my sponsor at the time, uh, made me write two letters, one to God, uh, to ask for the willingness to make the leap if that's truly what I wanted. And the second letter he made me write was my resignation letter to my job before I'd actually quit. And I taped it up near my computer and I looked at it every day until I realized that the pain of me not doing this would be greater than um, the pain of me doing it because worst case scenario, if I would have failed, I would have just been working at rush (laughs) (laughs) or someplace else as a salesman. I don't know, man. You know, like I knew I had a salesman skill set, and I knew I would always be in demand. And, uh, and my dad's like, honestly, like, dude, what do you got to lose? Like, he scared the shit out of me. He's like, you can always come back home and live. And I was like, Oh God, no. <laughs> Anything but that. God, no. <laughs> it's like, I'm never going to fail. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if the tables for whatever reason, something happens, you've all, you've always got a, uh, a job. Welcome at rush. And Bill, it was, it was great having you on the show, man. I had a lot of fun. And, um, thanks everyone for, for listening to self made and sober. If you enjoyed the episode, Please like, share, subscribe, all those things that aren't going to put money in my pocket, but I do appreciate the, uh, the thumbs up and, you know, hopefully we can, we can have a a big impact and be able to reach people that maybe can't hear this message, but really need it. So thanks again, Bill. It's great talking to you. Thanks for having me on the show, Andrew. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening to Self Made and Sober. Be sure to join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash SMC Mastermind, like Self Made Coaching Mastermind. I hope you enjoyed the show and be sure to subscribe and rate the show so you can get notified each Friday when we put out a new episode.